preface by saying this, um, that we're going to be, for this study, we're going to be using the New American Standard Bible. Amen? This is another faithful, faithful translation of the Bible. But Romans is one of those books that are very, sometimes can be very hard to understand. Amen? So in order to help us, uh, one of the more faithful translations of the Bible is the New American Standard uh, translation. Amen? And so, um, you, so uh, um, we're going to be using that. That's what you'll be seeing on the screen is the NASB. Amen? So it may read a little differently than the, than the Bible that you had than the King James, but it's very, very close. Very, very close. Amen? But it's more easier to understand. Amen? So the book of Romans, I hope you all come uh, with expectations, many of the, uh, of the foundational doctrines that we believe, many of those things that are espoused in our faith are, are, are laid out clearly um, in the book of Romans, amen, um, almost to uh, dispel any doubt, and, and, and I thank God that um, we're beginning this journey because the book of, the book of Romans really um, leaves no room for doctrinal errors, amen. I know we live in a, a day and time, self-help, you know, and we live in a day and time where people, are, you know, want to feel good and all these things, but we need the truth, amen? We need the truth. If the truth cuts, it, we need the truth, amen? If it convicts you, we need the truth. If it encourages you, we need the truth. But what we need is the truth, amen? We don't forsake the truth to make someone feel good, amen? We don't forsake the truth or tell a lie just because it's, it might hurt someone's feelings. Amen? We speak the truth. Amen? And that's what we are commanded to do. Now, we do that in love, though. We do that in love, and uh, that's what we are commanded to do. Now, now, why do I say that? M many of you probably today seen the video circulating of the little boy asking about his father. Y'all saw that? Asked the Pope about his father and said, um, said to, the, to the Pope that uh, my father was an atheist. Will I see him when I go to heaven? And the Pope said that what? He said that a father won't abandon his son, so when you get to that, you'll see him. That's, that's what the Pope said. Now, why? Here's my question. That's talking with this, uh, to my wife about this. Now, why? Because um, at, at, as what we call um, Protestants, or, or, or uh, let's just say Baptists, we believe in the authority of the Word of God, that the Word of God is the final authority for life and practice. That's orthodoxy, orthopraxy. What does that mean? That means what we believe and what we practice. We believe the word of God informs us on all that, all right? Whereas um, the Catholic Church believes that there are three authorities, okay? And, and those three authorities is the word of God, first of all, but equal to the word of God is the traditions of the church, and equal to the word of God is the Pope, okay? So what the Pope speaks, they believe, is the very word of God. All right? So that's the reason why he can make certain edicts and things like that. And that's what the Catholic Church believes. Now, we don't espouse that belief. Amen? We believe that if it goes against the Word of God, then you are wrong. The Word of God is not wrong. Amen? Now, the problem with that is if you look at what many of the things that many of the popes have said over the years, they completely contradict each other. The Bible says God cannot lie. So it cannot be the Word of God. Amen? Because God cannot lie. Amen? So the next time somebody comes to tell you, God told them to tell you, and it don't come to, come to pass, you know that's not from God. Amen? Because God cannot lie. And the Bible says if a man tells you that he heard from God and it's a lie, that man is a false prophet. That's what the Bible says. That's the word of God. Amen? All right, so we look at, so as we jump into the book of Romans tonight, I want to give you this outline. I gave it to you Sunday. Very simple outline. What do we find in the book of Romans? Well, in the book of Romans, of course, it, may, it is the Paul's letter to the church at Rome. All right. Now, Rome is a place is a place of, uh, 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 of you know complete paganism. They have a whole mythological system of gods. Amen. And and so here at this church, there are Jewish believers, and there are also Gentile believers. Now, these as we go through the book, you're going to see that these believers are at odds with one another. The Jews are kind of exalting themselves because of their background and heritage, and the, the Gentile who are, who are, are Rome, Romans are doing the same thing. Amen? So there's division in the church. So then Paul writes this letter, and his intent with the letter is to show that the gospel unites, the gospel brings peace, the gospel brings harmony. Amen? So he does that in two ways. He starts, number one, by showing salvation worked in, right? That means God did it for me. 
Salvation worked in. So what does that mean? That none of us, so to them he's saying, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, no matter what your background is, Greek, no matter, no matter how high or what your social economic status is, you cannot be made right with God on your own. God had to do it for you. That puts us all on the same playing field. You have no right to exalt yourself over another brother because you are just as simple as they are. Amen. So this doctrine, he's going to spell it out in the next couple chapters, but I'll give it to you now. This doctrine is called total depravity. Okay? That all humans are totally depraved. Now when you hear that, you'll be like, no, nah, I ain't depraved. Because you think that that means that you are Adolf Hitler or something. But that's not what it means. Totally depraved means you are completely incapable of saving yourself. That's what it means to be totally depraved. It doesn't mean that you are as worse off as you can be. It means that you are incapable of saving yourself. Now, how many of you think you can save yourself? Mm. By your good deeds and your good works. No, God had to do it for you. So chapters 1 through 8 can be seen as salvation worked in. And then chapters 9 through 16 is showing salvation worked out. So God did it for me, and as a result of God doing this for me, now there are some things that I do as a result of that. My obedience, the way I treat one another. When I, so when you, what Paul says is when you recognize what God has done in your life, what it will do for you is it will cause you to be able to treat people differently. Right? It will cause you to be able to talk to people, talk to people and live the way you look at the government. All of those different things are spelled out in this book. Amen? All right, so let's jump into it. Tonight we're going to be looking at this subject. I don't know if we're going to get, get through all 17 verses, but we'll pick up where we leave on. I am not ashamed. Amen? Mm. Verse 1, listen to what it says. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, verse 1, he, he, he jumps right into it, and the first thing he says is Paul. Now, different than our culture, we sign our names at the end of our letters. And, 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 you know, when we write a letter, we put it love, sincerely, EJ, or something like that, right? But in that, this time, in this culture, they wrote their name at the beginning of it. They want you to know, I think we should probably practice that, right? Because if you don't, if you know who it is before you start reading the letter, you might not read it. Eh? <laughs> so he's like, Paul. Now, who is Paul? Right? This is the same Paul who was once called, what? Saul. Now, um, was Saul's name changed? Yes and no. Okay? Because Saul is the Hebrew uh, pronunciation of his name. Yeah. Paul is the Roman or the Greek uh, pronunciation of his name. It's the same name. However, at a certain point in time, he started to refer to himself by his Roman name. Amen? Because he probably was more so known by his Hebrew name, Saul. Amen? Uh, all right, man. And so we know that in Acts chapter 8, it begins... Uh, the persecution that Saul did against the church. He persecuted the church heavily, right? Acts chapter 8. But then in Acts chapter 9, you have that miraculous conversion of Saul on the road of Damascus. You remember he's going to persecute the church, and what happens? What happens is the light shines from heaven, and it's Jesus Christ himself knocks him off his feet, and he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? He's blinded, and the Bible says he goes into Damascus, and there Ananias, God tells Ananias to go and pray for him, and the scales will fall off his eyes. But he said to him, I'm going to show him how much things he must suffer for my sin. And this is one of the great and historical facts that gives so much credence to, to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ is this radical conversion of, of, of Saul, amen, and he, he, to, to Paul, amen. So now watch this, Paul, a bond servant of Christ. Somebody say bond servant. Bond. Now, the word bond servant is, it, it, it is an indentured servant. Okay? So what does that mean? That means this is not someone who has been kidnapped in, in the American form and, and literally hardly anywhere in the Bible do you see the American, uh, our American history form of slavery. So, so when someone, someone tells you that the Bible condoned American slavery, that's a lie. Because the slavery that you see in the Bible is not what happened in America. The Bible says clearly that it is an abomination to God to steal a man and make him your servant. But when you see the word all times in the Bible, servant, this is what you're actually seeing, bond servant. And this is someone whose economic status is so low that they, they willingly put themselves into servitude. 
Amen. They, they put themselves into a, uh, a willing servitude. Amen. And this said that, 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 that almost 75% of Rome, of the Roman Empire, were slaves. Doctors, but they're slaves. Because of the, the, because of the, the disproportionate wealth. Amen. That people literally had to make themselves, sell themselves into slavery in order to take care of their families. So here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I am a slave to Jesus Christ. I am a willing, I have willingly enslaved myself, indebted myself to Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you, family, that that ought to be the testimony of all of us. He gives his name, then he says, you know who I am? I am a servant. But that's what Jesus has called all of, of us to be, family. He has called all of us to be servants. We want to tell folk what our titles are. We want to tell folk what our resume says. But the question is, are you a servant? Are you a servant? He says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. And then he says, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now I need to, I'm, I'm taking my time with this. I want to show you something. And here's what I want to show you next. He, he says, watch this, called as an apostle. Now in the Bible, there is capital A apostle, and there is lowercase a apostle. Everybody get this, because you're going to see that in some texts, you will see Barnabas is called an apostle, but he's not a capital A apostle. He's a lowercase a apostle. Amen? So, so just let me be very clear about what I'm saying. Are there any more apostles? No. There are no more capital A apostles, because there were three criteria that made you apostle according to Scripture. Amen? And those criteria is, number one, you had to have been with Jesus. You have to physically have seen Jesus. Physically have seen him. Jesus had to have called you to be an apostle. And you had to have the evidence of that with miraculous works. That's, that was the bi biblical evidence. And this is historical. This is, this, this, is, this is not just Bible, but also the, the, the early church, because you have people that try to make themselves apostles. But Paul says, I didn't make myself anything. I was called to be. When Jesus showed, uh, showed himself to me on, uh, on the Damascus road, he called me. I physically saw him, and the evidence of that was what? The miracles that he did. Amen? So sometimes we ask ourselves this question, why were the certain miracles seen the way they, they're seen in the New Testament but not seen today? Well, here's one of the reasons why. Because God was confirming the work that he was doing in the early church. Amen? There was no New Testament scriptures at that time. Everybody understand what I'm saying? But there are no more capital A apostles. I don't care what they tell you. Because the Bible says... That they had to see, they had to have seen Jesus. Jesus had to be the one to call them, and they needed to have the evidence of, of the miraculous. Amen. Now, what's happening today is people are calling themselves apostles. Yeah. Right? People are anointing themselves to be whatever they are. Amen. This is according to scriptures. Now watch this. And then he says, watch this, set apart for the gospel of God. That this is what God has done. God not only, God, God called him, saved him, uh, 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 set him apart to be an apostle, but then the work, particular work that Paul is set apart to do is the gospel of God. Now what does he mean by that? He says that, that, that all God has called me to do is to go out and preach the word of God. Okay? And so then when you see, the, when you see the lowercase apostle, all that is is missionary. The word apostle means sent out. Okay? So, so it's the same thing as a missionary. Everybody understand that? So verse 2, which, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was born of a, descend, of a descendant of David according to, the, according to the flesh, verse 4, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now what is he saying here? He says, that he was called, set apart to the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? Then he says in verse, he says in verse 2, the gospel of God is that which was promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures. 
He's talking about all those things that the prophets prophesied about in the Old Testament. It was, it was declared hundreds of years before Jesus even came that he would come, that he would die. Right? I said this to you last week, but I, I challenge you to look at things like this, certain prophecies, and how could uh, the, 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 the chances of those things actually come into pass. When David said in Psalm 22 that they nailed my hands and nailed my feet, that they cast lots for my clothes, what is the chances of that actually happening when history says David's hands would never pierce, his feet would never pierce, they never gambled for his clothes? What is the likelihood of that actually happening to Jesus verbatim? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so this is the reason why he says, watch this, holy scriptures. Now, family, I challenge every believer in here tonight that you need to check your view of scripture. Because we live in a day and time where it's all about our opinion. It's all relative. How you feel. What does that mean to me? How does that feel? Family, there is only one interpretation of scripture. There are many applications of scripture, but there is only one interpretation. That means it means what it meant when they wrote it. Amen? Of course, we have application from that. We, we, we draw principles from that, but it only means one thing. Amen? And so then, what we have been called to do as believers is to elevate our view of Scripture. It's not about how I feel about it. It's not about what I think it means to me. It's about what does the Scripture actually say. Amen? And if you believe it is the word of God, it is the word of God, then you have to say, okay, then if this is the word of God, I need to know what God says and not necessarily what I think or what I feel. Amen? But we live in a day and time. This is the reason why false doctrine is so, is so prevalent. And this is the reason why I beat that drum, family. I hope you don't get tired of that. I'm going to continue to beat that drum. I need you to know that. I'm going to beat the drum about false doctrine because there's too many lives broken over it. Too many people suffering because they believe lies. Amen? Too many people with a false hope. You don't need false hope when you got Jesus Christ. Amen? Now watch what it says, family. It says, who was declared? Look at this. Now, in verse 3, it says, concerning his son, talking about Jesus, who was born of a, of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Right? And then verse 4, it says, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. What is this saying? It's, talking, it's, it's telling you the truths of who Jesus Christ actually is and who we believe in. You are, you are not a Bible-believing Christian if you don't believe that Jesus was both man and God. He has to be man and God for the gospel that we believe to even work. He had to be man in order to, substitute, to be our substitute. And he had to be God for it to be effectual and eternal. Do you understand that? And the scriptures over and over again teach it. Now listen, whether or not you believe that is one thing or another, but you cannot deny that that's what the Bible teaches. Amen? The Bible that we read, that's what it teaches. All right? This is what we call the hypostatic union. Both God and man. This is the reason why he's called the begotten son of God. The only one of his kind. Not born, but the only one of his kind. Amen? Watch this. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Now, I'm going to come back and we talk about that a little bit later. The obedience of faith. We'll talk about that in a few chapters down the road. Because, you know, today we live in a day and time that... Um, when we talk about obedience, we think the only way we can be, some people will tell you the only way you can be obedient is you have to have a law. No, our obedience is not because of the law. Our obedience is because of the love of God. You all are here. You, you're not here because you are afraid of punishment. You're not here tonight because you think, oh, oh Jesus is going to get me if I don't come to Bible study. No, that's legalistic. That's under the law. I'm here because Jesus loved me. And I want to show him that I love him back. I want to have a relationship with him. It is the obedience of faith. That, 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 that the faith that I have placed in Christ Jesus, it leads to my obedience. Right. Amen? I'm not, oh, I'm not here because I think God's going to punish me. No, Jesus already took my punishment. I'm here because I love Jesus Christ. I'm here because I want to have a relationship. Paul put it like this. Paul says like this, Oh, that I may apprehend that which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. What does he mean? He means I'm trying to catch up with what caught me. That Jesus caught me on the Damascus road, and ever since then, I've been chasing him. 
That's why we sing the song, Chasing After You. Right? I'm chasing after Jesus because I want to have a fruitful relationship with him. Amen? Think about how you, how you how, bros, how you do with your, how you do, how you do with your children and how you do with your relationship. Isn't that what you do? You chase after them. If you're going to have a fruitful relationship, you have to chase after it. And that's what we do. That's why we're here. Because we're not, we're not satisfied with the simple and the mundane. Right? What, what, what Pastor Lawson said, we, we, we don't want mediocrity. Amen. Amen. It's like you heard Pastor Lawson say it? No, somebody told me. <laughs> I was dead in the spirit of Jesus. <laughs> All right, now watch this. All right, verse, verse 6 says, um, among whom are, you also are the call of Jesus Christ, right? Now, verse 7, watch this, because this is controversial. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Called as saints. Grace to you and peace from my God, our Lord Jesus, uh, 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 grace and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is still a salutation. But look what he says. He says, to the saints who are at Rome. That's power. Number one, because he calls, this is what the Bible declares, that all believers are saints. That, that there is not something that is, that, that, that is, that is um, put up on you posthumously. That after you die, you become a saint based on how you lived when you, when you were alive. No, the Bible, the scriptures teach that all believers are saints. That we are made saints by Jesus Christ. We are given his righteousness. Amen? But then he says this, the saints who are at Rome. Rome. Now I need you to get this because Rome was one of the most wicked places that you, that, that you can ever think about. I don't even think America has caught up with Rome yet. With what you, what you study about and learn about Rome. Rome was wicked. And listen, listen to what he says. But this is to the saints who are living in Rome. So don't tell me that you can't live holy because of where you're at. Or because of your environment. Or because of people that surround you. No, we are called to be saints no matter where our context is. Amen? But old oh, Reverend, you don't know how they treat me. But you don't know how they were acting in Rome, though. But he said they were still saints even in Rome. Amen? So you are called to be a Christian irrespective of the context that you find yourself living in. Somebody say amen if you can. But what, we, what do we want to do? We want to blame everybody else for the reason why we act the way we act. We want to blame everybody else for our lashing out, for our anger. Right? But the word of God says, no family, you are called to be a saint irrespective of where you find your context. Amen? And so then what should your prayer be? Lord, help me to live out what you have called me to be in my context. Don't you wish you could change your context? I promise you I wish I could change my context sometimes. I wish that, 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 that when I go to work, they weren't always looking at me like, I know you're a pastor, right? I know you're a pastor, and, it's, and, and, and maybe you're not performing the way you should perform because it's, your pastorship is taken away from you. But they always own me like that, right? But I can't change that. I can't change the way people look at me. But I can do something about how I treat them. I can do something about how I respond. Amen? So all of us have our context. Don't think that your context is the All of us have context that we wish we could change. Sometimes they're pleasurable. Sometimes they're comfortable. But sometimes they're not. He says, called to be saints. Look, called, called as saints. Grace to you and peace from God. Every time you read a book of Paul, this is how it starts off. His salutation is always grace and peace. It's powerful given the context of who he's writing to. He's writing to the, he's writing to the Jews and the, the, the Romans, the non-Jews. Now, the Jews, we all know this, have the um, greeting. When they see each other, they say what? Shalom, which means peace. The Romans or the Greeks, they, 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 their, their salutation is grace. Do you see that? But he turns around and says grace and peace. Now, but he, that's also unifying just in the way that he says that. Grace and peace is unifying. But this is unique to Paul. And the reason why it's unique because that's the gospel in two words. That's the gospel in two words. Listen to what he says. Grace and peace. 
that you cannot have the peace of God until you first have the grace of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? That until you, you come into the saving faith of relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot have peace. Amen. That our peace is as a result of the grace of God. Amen? Watch what he says. Now, I, I love verse 8. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Do you see that? Now, family, when folk talk about Mount Peregrine, what are they talking about? Right? When folk talk about you, what are they talking about? Are they talking about how messy you are? All these gossiping. They talk about how ugly your attitude is. Or do folk talk about your faith? Right? He says your faith is being talked about over the whole world. And I pray to God that someone who would talk about me after my dying, that they would say that I was a believer. That they would know about me, you know, without me having to wear and walk around with a shirt on and say, I love Jesus. That they would know that I love Jesus because of the way I act. Or because of the way I talk, or because of the way I respond in stressful situations. I pray that something about my life, when I leave folk, that they will know that I love Jesus. And can I tell you why? Can I just be real? Because I've left too many folk with some other kind of thoughts. I've left too many folks saying how ugly I was. I've left too many folks saying how mean I was. But oh, if God gives me grace, I want to change that. That every person that I come into contact with, they'll say, that's a believer of Jesus Christ. That that man loves God and he loves people. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Anybody just want to change the narrative that folk will be better because they've come into contact with us. Look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says. He says, for God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests. If perhaps now, at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. There's a lot there, man. There's a whole lot there. Look what he says. He says, he makes mention of them in, in their prayers unceasingly. Mm -hmm. How many of us have that testimony? Mm -hmm. You know, family, you can't do everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. But you can pray. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes when you want to, yeah. you can't. Mm -hmm. But you can't pray. Yeah. Right? Unceasingly. Prayer is not a last resort. Mm -hmm. Prayer is not just some fly-by answer. Mm -hmm. Amen? Prayer is what we do. Now, family, um, we live in a day time where folk will tell you, um, so a lot of our, our TV preachers and evangelists will tell you that all you need to do is speak it. That you don't have to pray. But you're not going to find that in Scripture. You know what you, you, know what you want to find in Scripture? Pray. pray. Watch this. With the nuances of prayer. Look at the nuances of prayer as, as it pertains to Paul, the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says. He says, I make mention of you in my prayers always. Now, what, what is he praying about? What, what is Paul praying about? What is this fervent and unceasing prayer about that he's praying when it comes to the church of Rome? If perhaps now, at last, look, by the will of God, if I may succeed in coming to you. Do you see what he's saying? He says, I want to be there and I want to preach to you in Rome. I want to be able to come because he didn't start this church. But he wants to come and be able to preach to them and, and share with them and teach them the word of God. He wants to get there. But look what he says. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine, watch this, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented. Now, do you see that? Now, this is what I'm trying to tell you, family. I'm, I'm trying to show you that the Apostle Paul shows us what Christian life is really all about. Don't you let these health and wealth preachers fool you into thinking that there's something else going on than what's actually going on. This is the Apostle Paul saying, I pray to God over and over again that I may be able to come to Rome. But up until this point, God has told me no. 
That's what he says. And so then when he prayed, he prayed what? By the will of God. What does that mean? That means, family, you pray and you pray without ceasing, but you also recognize that God is sovereign. We don't command God. God is not bound to do what we tell him to do because we said it. Or because you paid a certain amount of money. Or because you spoke it with a certain amount of faith. Or because you had size, faith with the size of the mustard seed, Jesus. No, sir, and no man. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it's time for us to be biblical Christians. Not 2018 American Christians. Because if you can't preach that in Africa, it don't work. If you can't preach it in Ethiopia, if you can't preach it where they're starving at, then that ain't the gospel. The gospel is to be preached everywhere. Now you're going to tell someone who's starving to death that they can speak it into existence. You're going to tell a folk in Flint, Michigan, whose, whose water pipes are still poisonous to this day, that they ain't got enough faith. You see, that gospel don't work in that context, do it? It works when you already got a bunch of money. It works when ain't nobody holding you responsible for that crap that you're saying. But you don't see the poor man hurting because they believed your lies. I read, I, it, it, it broke my heart to read about a, 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 a woman a, a woman who had died. She had stage four cancer. She died. And the documentary said, says that after she died, she left nothing. This was a wealthy woman, but she left nothing for her children. And her children were trying to figure out what in the world happened. Where did all her money go? But they got on her computer after she died, and once they got on the computer, they saw she was sending all her money to some TV preacher in order to get healed. Did you hear me what I said? And you're going to tell me that it's something that, that we don't need to preach this? That we don't need to expose the truth of what the gospel actually says? Now, I don't know if there's any folk, anybody like here that's, that's like that. I don't know if there's anybody here who's believed lies, but I've been there. All of us on our journey to maturity have been there. You are not responsible for that, but you are responsible. Now that the truth has been spoken to you, you are responsible for what you do with the truth. Do you hear me what I said? Look what he says, and our time is at hand. Um, he says that he prays by the will of God. And that God is sovereign. But then he says this, and next week we're going to start at verse, uh, so let me say this, I am also, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Now what he means by this is, he's under obligation to preach the gospel, watch this, to the Greeks and to the barbarians. What, is he, what, what that means is the Greeks, the Greek is, um, when you ever hear preachers talk, when preachers try to be, try to be deep, they'd be like, yeah, in a Greek, that really means, you know? <laughs> you ever see they do that? The reason why they do that is because Greek is the most perfect language, okay? It, it, it is the most perfect language. So, so for one of, our, one of our American words, probably got like four or five different Greek words, amen? It's very, very precise, amen? And so now watch this. So Greek, when he used the word Greek, he means those who are well-educated. And when he used the word barbarian, he's not talking about, you probably think about caveman when he used to use the word barbarian, but that's not what he means. He means those who are uneducated. And the Greeks, in their mind, because they were so pompous, everybody who were uneducated, they said that they, the way they talked was bar, 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 bar. And that's where you get the word barbarian from. Amen? So, so what, what they're saying, what, so what Paul is saying is, I'm, watch this family, I'm under obligation to preach the gospel to everybody. Do you see what I'm saying? He says, you need to stop with that mentality that only certain folk can come to your church. You understand? And when somebody comes to your church that don't look like us, is, can we make them sit by themselves? Right? Or they can't sit with us. Or this is my role right here. Right? That ain't the gospel family. He says, the gospel goes to everybody. You don't, you, you don't treat folk based on the way that they, they can reciprocate. The Bible says you already got your reward. The gospel is for everybody. Christian love is for everybody. Hospitality is for everybody. Caring and concern is for everybody. Hello, somebody. Y'all looking at me cross-eyed, but stop looking at me like that, man. Stop looking at me like that. I really don't know because I can't see that. I can't see that well anyway. But um, so you can look at me crazy all you want to, but anyway, because um, I can't see you no way. <laughs> Some kind of stigmatism. Anyway, so he says in verse fifteen. So. For my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. 
Last two verses, and I'm finished, family, please. Last two verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who speaks in tongues. Nah, that ain't what it's saying. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who is baptized. No, that's not what it's saying. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is, what, for it, what, what do we find in the gospel? In it is what? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. I'm finished with this. What does he mean from faith to faith? It means that even though I ask you, are you saved? And you say, yeah, the true answer to that, the true biblical answer to that is not yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the true biblical answer to whether or not you are saved is not yet. Right? Because actually you are saved from the penalty of sin. Right? You are being saved from the presence of sin and from the power of sin, but ultimately you will be saved in glory from the very presence of sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's what sanctification is all about. So what is salvation? Salvation is justification. All of us are there who, who believe in Jesus Christ. But then it's sanctification, and that's where we all are right now. And then ultimately it's glorification when we are in heaven with Jesus. Amen? So when he says from faith to faith, family, that means the same faith that it took to save you is the same faith you need right now to make it through life. You don't stop believing in Jesus because you saved. You still need to, you know why? Because you still got folks you got to deal with every day. You still got mountains you got to climb every day. You got to believe the same Jesus that saved you can keep you. Amen? Well, I, 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 I'm going to need me a little more time in 30 minutes, y'all. <laughs> Let us all stand. Let us all stand.